All modern computer chips have a fundamental design flaw. This includes the very CPU and GPU you are using right now to watch this video. It's a problem that can't be fixed within your architecture because it's rooted in the manufacturing process itself. Today's semiconductor manufacturing is flawed in a way that has data and power pitted against each other, with both on a losing side. But it seems like there is finally a solution inside, with first products based on a brand new technology expected to release later this year. Backside power delivery is promising nothing short of a revolution, but in order to succeed, semiconductor manufacturing quite literally has to change. Let's take a look at how backside power delivery works, what it's actually trying to solve, and discover why it has the potential to be the next big thing in semiconductors. To fully grasp the idea behind backside power delivery and why it's such a big deal, we need a basic understanding of the current semiconductor manufacturing process. As you probably know, manufacturing starts with a silicon wafer and photolithography. High-powered light and chemicals are used to etch and form complex structures, transistors, into the upper layer of the silicon wafer. Of course this is a very simplified explanation, but that's all we need right now. The silicon wafer itself is a lot thicker than the area affected by the photolithography, because the rest of the wafer is used as structural support. The transistors itself are so thin they would crumble at the slightest touch, if it wasn't for the stabilizing effects of the entire height of the wafer. The top of the silicon wafer, where the transistors are fabricated, is called the front side and the bottom, you guessed it, is called the back side. Front side and back side are terms related to the silicon wafer. It's basically different names for top and bottom. But building transistors is only the first step of the manufacturing process, also called front end of line. The next production step, the so called back end of line, is just as important. It's here where the metal layers are formed. Every computer chip has two distinct layers, silicon and metal. After the transistors are fabricated and the silicon layer is completed in the first manufacturing step, the second manufacturing step builds the metal layers right on top of the silicon layer. These metal layers have two functions. First, they allow the transistors to talk to each other by providing a signal network. And second, they route power to the transistors. Basically, the metal layers are the signal and power networks of the chip. Without metal layers, the silicon underneath would be useless. Once the production of the metal layers is finished, the entire chip is then flipped with both silicon and metal layers facing downwards and connected into the substrate. That's why modern chips are so called flip chips because after manufacturing the entire chip is quite literally flipped upside down. If you remove the heatsink of your CPU, you are looking at the backside of the chip, which is also the backside of the silicon wafer. The most important takeaway is that with current semiconductor manufacturing, and that affects almost all modern chips, the metal layers, which contain the signal and power networks, are layered on top of the transistors. Everything is on the same side of the silicon wafer. And because this side is called the front side, both signal and power networks are currently on the front side. I guess this already gives you an idea of what's about to change with backside power delivery. But why change something in the first place? Routing both signal and power networks on the front side of the chip has worked so far. There are different reasons for switching to backside power delivery, but the number one reason is limited space. Semiconductors have become more and more complex over the recent years, with modern CPUs and GPUs containing billions of transistors and new process nodes steadily increasing transistor density. Transistors are smaller and more tightly packed than ever before. And while high transistor density is a positive aspect, when it comes to silicon lithography, it's a problem for the metal layers, because more transistors also require more signal and power connections. The metal layers have to keep up with the process node improvements of the silicon, and it's harder to scale metal than it is to scale silicon. Metal layers are hitting a brick wall. There isn't enough space for all the wires, at least not without heavy compromises. Especially when running signal and power wires too close to each other can introduce interference. For data signals, you want tiny wires with a small cross-section and low capacitance, while resistance isn't much of an issue. For power wires, you want the opposite. High capacitance, a large cross-section, and the lowest amount of resistance possible. Data signals also don't really care if they have to travel through multiple metal layers, as long as the signal is clearly readable. But each additional metal layer increases resistance for the power delivery, resulting in voltage drop. It's bad enough that signal and power compete for the limited amount of space in the metal layers on the front side of the chip, 
but they also have contrary engineering requirements, meaning if you optimize for one, the other suffers. The current front-side only approach leads to a very compromise-based design, where neither signal nor power networks are performing well. You can't design an optimal signal network because of the limited space, and the power network is affected by high voltage drop because it has to travel through a large amount of metal layers to get to the transistors, which significantly reduces efficiency. This image shows a cross-section of a typical metal layer stack, though modern chips already have a lot more layers than shown here. The silicon layer at the bottom only accounts for a fraction of the chip thickness and almost seems insignificant compared to the multiple stacks of metal on top. The metal layer closest to the silicon, called the M0 layer, has the smallest wires, as it has to connect to the contact points formed within the silicon, which are very small. Because of this, the M0 metal layer requires advanced manufacturing techniques and extreme precision, making it very expensive to produce. It's also problematic to directly connect materials with different physical and chemical characteristics, like copper or aluminium, to silicon, which is why metals such as titanium or cobalt are often used as so-called barrier metals. If we start at the silicon at the bottom of the stack, building up from the M0 metal layer, step by step, every new metal layer is increasing in size so that the layer at the very top is large enough to connect the chip to the substrate. It's kind of like a reverse pyramid. On the bottom, you need to be small enough to interface with transistors. On the top, you need large contact points to connect the die with the substrate and the PCB. Insane levels of engineering. Looking at actual pictures of a metal layer cross-section, we can clearly see the incremental miniaturization of the interconnects the closer the metal gets to the silicon. Of course, a cross-section shows only a tiny part of the signal and power networks. This illustration from a Financial Times article does a very good job at a 3D representation. You can see how signal and power wires are independent networks inside the same metal layers. And while they are clearly separated in the upper parts, the further down you go, the closer power and signal wires get. Because in the end, both power and signal have to connect to the transistors on a silicon layer, which doesn't leave a lot of room for physical separation. And that's precisely the flaw within the current manufacturing process. Running everything on the front side of the wafer, signal and power, is creating an artificial bottleneck, as both types of networks have to compete with each other for limited resources. Now that we know how metal layers are manufactured at the moment, and why the combination of signal and power on the front side of the chip has a lot of drawbacks, let's take a look at the backside power delivery from a manufacturing point of view. How does the production process change with this new technology? It's important to know that there's more than one approach to backside power delivery. Power Via, which is a marketing name for Intel's version of backside power delivery, is on track to be the first available solution. Intel's next-gen 20A process node implements Power Via and will be used for selected Arrow Lake CPUs. Intel also created an internal test node that combines Intel 4 with Power Via in order to gain experience ahead of mass production. For this reason, we will focus on the manufacturing process of Intel's implementation though other variants will have a similar manufacturing process. The first manufacturing steps of a chip with power wire aren't that different. We still start with a silicon wafer and photolithography. Once the transistors are fabricated, metal layers are again built on the front side of the wafer, just like before. But this time, the front side metal layers only contain the signal network. When the front side metal layers are finished, a hermetic seal is placed on top of it to prepare the next step. It's here where the production process of backside power delivery really starts to deviate, because a second silicon wafer, also called carrier wafer, is introduced. This wafer is bonded on the top of the front side and placed right above the hermetic seal. This carrier wafer doesn't contain any active silicon. It's only used for structural support, because in order to prepare the original wafer, the one with the transistors, for backside power delivery, all the silicon on the backside of this wafer, which was previously used for structural support, has to be removed to reveal the backside contact points. This means the original wafer loses its function as structural support, hence the introduction of an additional carrier wafer. Once the silicon wafer is thinned down and the backside contacts are revealed, the backside metal layers are built and since the data signals are already on the front side, the backside metal layers only contain the power network. Well, almost, because the chip still needs to communicate with the outside, which means some kind of signal wires are still needed on the backside of the chip, which will be the side facing towards the substrate. That's something most articles on backside power delivery don't mention, 
because the absolute majority of the data signals are for chip internal communications. External I.O. only takes up a fraction of the signal network. Still, a more honest name would be backside I.O. and power delivery. The end result looks very different from the current frontside manufacturing. Before, the silicon wafer was at the bottom of the stack and also gave structural support to the entire chip with metal layers stacked on top. With backside power delivery, the original silicon wafer is sandwiched in between frontside and backside metals. And because it had to be thinned down to allow for connections from both sides, a carrier wafer is bonded to the top of the stack for structural support. This image of Intel's power wire technology is great at showing the true scale. On the bottom, you can see the backside metal layers, which are optimized for power delivery with large cross sections to reduce resistance. The tiny white line in the middle is the silicon layer with all the transistors. And on top, you can see the highly complex front side signal network. Crazy to think that 99% of the chip are metal layers and the actual silicon is almost invisible. Another difference is that a backside power delivery chip doesn't need to be flipped since the backside is the part that connects to the substrate and the PCB. Goodbye flip chip. As mentioned before, Intel already has an internal validation process for power via and they used it to design a chip code named Blue Sky Creek. Blue Sky Creek is a very small chip only containing four Crestmont E cores with a tiny die size of 33.2 square millimeters. Lucky for us, Intel was kind enough to share initial test results. Let's compare the metal layers first. On the standard Intel 4 node, Intel is using 16 metal layers on the front side. That's for both power and signal networks. Interestingly, with backside power delivery, the front side metals of Blue Sky Creek don't change that much, as it still has 14 layers, a reduction by only two layers. Removing the power network from the front side doesn't really reduce the amount of metal layers you need to connect all the transistors to the signal network. But remember, data signals don't care about the number of layers they have to travel through. 14 metal layers is not a problem for the signal network on the front side of Blue Sky Creek. The more important part is that with the power network gone from the front side, you have more freedom to design the signal network exactly as you want. More on that in just a minute. The really interesting part is the backside metals, where the power network and a tiny bit of I.O. is located. With power wire, the test chip only had to use five metal layers on the backside, which means that the power signal only has to travel through five layers in order to reach the transistors, a huge reduction from the previously 16 layers and the results speak for themselves. Intel observed a 30% reduction in voltage drop, an amazing outcome for a first generation test chip. Less voltage drop directly translates into a cleaner power delivery and increased energy efficiency because less energy is lost to resistance. And the cleaner power delivery has even more benefits. Intel also observed a 6% increase in E-core clock speeds just because there's less deviation in voltage. And while 6% might not be that much, it's a nice bonus on top. The chip is more efficient and clocks higher at the same time. It shows that with current manufacturing, the silicon is already limited by the front side only approach. The power signals are so compromised, they can't supply enough clean voltage to the transistors to take full advantage of their true capabilities. Power wire fixes that. Next, let's talk about production costs because there's another surprise waiting for us. Using power wire is actually cheaper than the current front side fabrication. But how is that possible? Backside manufacturing seems a lot more complex and even uses an extra silicon wafer for structural support. The reason is simple. Moving the power network to the backside of the chip leaves more room for the signal network on the front side, which means you can implement a design that's strictly optimized for data signals. This allowed Intel to relax the pitch of the M0 metal layer. Instead of a 30 nanometer pitch with the standard Intel 4 node, Blue Sky Creek with power wire uses a slightly larger 36 nanometer pitch for the M0 metal. And even though it doesn't sound like much, this 20% increase in pitch size translates into a larger cost reduction as the most complex part of the metal layers just became 20% less complex. And less complex means cheaper to manufacture. It's kind of funny that a new technology allows parts of the chip to become larger than before. And if you think all of this sounds a bit too good to be true, think again, because the best is yet to come. There's another advantage to backside power delivery that, in my opinion, is the real reason why this technology is so important. It has to do with the buzzword Design Technology Co-Optimization, DTCO for short. All you need to know about DTCO is that it's a term to describe different technologies 
used to optimize everything surrounding the design and production of computer chips. DTCO looks at different ways to improve manufacturing, and backside power delivery is such a technology, as it can have a profound impact on the photolithography node, even though it's not directly part of it. Let me explain. All process nodes follow certain design rules, and these rules are not only influenced by the silicon characteristics itself, like how small you could make a transistor or a single cell in theory, but also by factors such as the metal layers that interface with the transistors. Let's take a standard cell for example, that's designed for a current front side only process. The size of the cell is in part determined by the power and signal lines it has to connect to. You can't just further reduce the size of transistors if that means that a standard cell doesn't have enough space for signal and power contacts. Reducing the transistor size without scaling the metal layer doesn't work. Backside power delivery removes this limitation by moving the power lines to the side or backside of the cell, where it doesn't compete for space with the signal lines. To summarize, backside power delivery in the form of Intel's power wire enables improved energy efficiency, higher clock speeds, increased cell density, and it's cheaper to produce at the same time. At the start of this video, I said that I think backside power delivery has the potential to be the next big thing in semiconductors. And I hope you now understand why I think so. It's very rare that a new technology has such profound positive effects. The concept started as an idea to combat the growing voltage drop problem introduced by the ever increasing numbers of metal layers on the front side of modern chips. And it absolutely delivers on that promise. Power via enables Intel to design a backside power network that only has to cross 5 metal layers instead of 16 and uses larger wires with lower resistance, greatly reducing efficiency loss and increasing block speeds at the same time. Plus, a more relaxed metal layer pitch on the front side reduces production complexity and cost. But the true game changer is the impact on cell area scaling. New process nodes increasingly struggle to keep up with Moore's law. Transistor density scaling has slowed down. At the same time, production costs of leading edge nodes are exploding. A technology that, outside of the silicon node itself, has such a profound impact on cell scaling and utilization is an incredible opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised to see backside power delivery named alongside technologies such as FinFats and EUV in the future. It very well might have a similar impact. The race to get backside power delivery into production has already started, with Intel clearly in the lead. While I'm excited for Arrow Lake, I'm more excited to see how PowerWire performs in first production chips. It's a shame that only some Arrow Lake CPUs are expected to be produced in Intel's 20A node, while most parts will be using TSMC's N3 process. Don't get me wrong, it's not a bad node, but not nearly as exciting as 20A, especially when you consider that PowerWire isn't the only new technology, as 20A also introduces ribbon fat, Intel's gate all around transistors. Intel is pushing hard to establish its newly formed foundry services as a real competitor to TSMC and Samsung and PowerWire will be a key component in that push. 20A is Intel's internal node, while 18A will be available to all external Foundry customers. If Intel is able to compete with TSMC's latest 3 nanometer nodes, the entire semiconductor market could benefit from a renewed competition. On the flip side, if 20A and 18A are not competitive with TSMC's current offerings, it might be the beginning of the end for Intel's Foundry dreams. Samsung and TSMC are also working hard to implement backside power delivery in the near future. Samsung is expected to produce first backside power delivery chips in 2025, and TSMC might take until 2026 or even later for first products based on N2. It's going to be interesting to see different implementations of backside power networks, and which company will come up with the best solution. In any case, the semiconductor manufacturing process is changing, and I can't wait to see what's next. If you are interested in next-gen manufacturing technologies, I recommend you check out my video about Sen6 and the future of chip-to-chip -chip interconnects. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did and see you in the next one.